The day Nikki passed away, we were scheduled to see a psychiatrist. She'd had some psychotic issues where she had a brain tumor when she was very young and it was time to do some research on her. I think she was feeling nervous that if she were to go to this appointment, she might get stuck in the hospital because that had happened before. And at some point, a couple of hours before her appointment, she left the house. She took Christos's Porsche and drove away. I saw all the police and I started to walk down the on-ramp and they stopped me. And they said I wasn't allowed down there. And I asked if it was my daughter in the car, or what car it was. They wouldn't give me any information. And then a crane lifted up the car. And once it lifted up the car, I realized it was the Porsche. Adding to the tragedy, a first responder took photos of the nearly decapitated head of the girl and emailed it to some friends. Almost instantly, the pictures were out on the internet and hundreds of thousands, possibly millions, clicked on them. I received emails with the, with the pictures attached. And there was a short time after the accident. Um, it was disguised. I didn't know who the email came from. And I opened it up. The bad ones were very um, hateful, very um, hateful towards me, towards Nikki, towards our family. It said, dead girl walking, woohoo daddy, I'm still alive. Woohoo. Woohoo. Do you still feel the pain when you receive this? Yes. And it's never gonna leave you? Never. Some of the hate mail was so unspeakably horrifying that we cannot repeat it here. We were told there was nothing that could be done because there's no law in place for pictures of deceased people because when they pass away, their privacy rights go with them. I didn't know such depravity existed in humans. And I think dogs treat their kind better than humans treat their kind. It's just there is no dignity or respect on the internet because we're not held accountable. Nobody's there to tell us not to. I have always believed that the internet is a manifestation of the Antichrist, of evil itself. It is the spirit of evil. And I feel like it's running through everybody on earth. And it's claiming its victories in those people that are also evil. We're going to have a revolution, not only in our technology, but in our theology. We don't even have a name for it, but it's a, around the internet, it's around connectivity, it's around building machines that think for us. And I think we're due for another shift in our morals, in our, in our definition of what it means to be human. We're right just at the beginning of that. And so you can see us trying to kind of feel out and invent this new society and invent these new ideas of what's right and wrong. What can we depend on each other for? What we, can we expect from each other? Uh, how much do we want to do that? Uh, so I think it's an incredibly creative time in human history, not just technologically, um, but also morally and culturally.
this room, this room should know I'm here. I should be able to talk to it and should be able to give me an answer verbally. I should ask where, for example, is a high-speed printer or where did I leave my keys or where's a book on this subject and should answer me with speech, with a hologram, with a display in a very natural way. I should be able to use gestures and touch and, and even smell and all my senses to interact in a very humanistic way with this technology around us. And once that technology comes out into our physical world, and becomes embedded in our walls, in our desk, in our bodies, in our fingernails, in our cars, in our offices, in our homes, it should disappear and become invisible. Whereas electricity, there's a socket in the wall, you plug in, you get electricity. You don't care how it's made, it's not a complicated interface, it's invisible. The internet has yet to evolve to that goal I was hoping for of being invisible. I think we're going to get to the point where almost everything we do um, will be done by machines. And we we'll still will need people. But I mean, if you ask the question about will there ever be a, uh, a, a artificial intelligent machine that makes movies, absolutely yes. Will it be quite as good as yours? No one can, can even come close. Of, of course not. But <laughs> actually, I think, I think almost everything we do um, we find machines doing better. And the reason why that's the case is because machines just learn faster than people can learn. What's interesting about the Internet of Things is what you're going to build on top of it for you and for me. I call it the Internet of Me. It is a world where when you walk into a room, the lights dim to your preference level. You may have music that starts up. It may even have complex protocols for how to interact with somebody else's Internet of Me. Um, that's interesting, and the world that will emerge as a result. Eventually, you won't even need phones. Um, the, the environment will be so wired that your experience will be brought to you. Your calls will be brought to you, your advertising, your content, your, your work, all of it will come with you. That's an internet of me. It is going to take a leap of thought, a leap of uh, courage societally for us to accept a generation that's always had an egotistical world. We, we, tell, we tell children very often, you have to play with others, you have to share, your worldview isn't unique. But when the world, the objects in it, start to tell them that they are, that they're different, that's egotistical. But it will also be a magical world, one where a wave of the hand creates doors moving and objects changing position. Um, but with, imagine a generation that's never known anything else but that. I deeply regret the fact that deep critical thinking and, and imaginative thinking, the creative thinking is lost. In my opinion, computers, and in some sense the internet, are the worst enemy of deep critical thinking. Our youth of today are using machines to basically replace their examination of the things they're observing. They don't understand what they're looking at or what they're hearing or what they're learning. They depend upon the internet to tell them and decipher it. They look at numbers instead of ideas. They fail to understand concepts, and this is a problem. It used to be that when you communicated with someone, the person you were communicating with was as important as the information. Now on the internet, the person is unimportant at all. In fact, it was developed so that scientists could communicate, scientists like me could communicate with each other without knowing where the other person was or even who the other person was. There's a famous cartoon from The New Yorker which says, on the internet, no one knows if you're a dog. And in the future, you won't know if you're communicating with dogs or robots or people and it won't matter. But becoming your own filter will be the challenge of the future because the filter isn't provided with you. There's no controls on the internet, no matter what governments do, or no matter what industries do. The internet is gonna propagate out of control and people will have to be their own controls. My hope would be there are still going to be the, the appeal of deep immersion in something that through the school system we still subject our kids to, we can really try to turn them onto its charms so they become intrinsically self-motivated to pursue it.